Every Primarch in the Warhammer universe has a grand sweeping legacy, riddled with illustrious or, in some cases, nefarious deeds that create the imagery for the character throughout the space opera that is the Horus Heresy. But one Primarch's elusive tendencies and lightning fast and fierce combat doctrine match the humble origins of this distant relative to our own steppe warriors. From the sweeping and roiling plains of Chagoris to the steppes of Terra, the Kagan of the Fifth Legion is one of the most enigmatic Primarchs next to the twins of the Alpha Legion. In this video today, we'll be talking about Chagatai Khan, the Warhawk of Chagoris and Master of the White Scars. This is a video that I've taken my precious time on, but I think it's a very interesting one to get us back on track for our Primarch series, as the lore for the Great Khan has only really been fleshed out in the last five or so years, thanks to the many books written by Chris Wright that have come out in the Horus Heresy series. Through these writings, we get a hero that is both revered and reviled by the other Primarchs, and in different ways than, say, Conrad Kurz, the last Primarch we covered. Chagatai Khan has always lived outside of the normal fraternity of his 20, or I mean, well, 18 other brothers. This seems to be a reoccurring theme for the latter five Primarchs to be discovered. Chagatai, Conrad, Angren, Corvus, number 19, and Elpharius, in that order. Perhaps it's because that they have, you know, lived for much longer periods of times on their respective homeworlds and were able to develop a bit more of a world view, who knows? But each one of these Primarchs has a very interesting backstory. We'll be discussing the simple beginnings of the Great Khan in the empty quarter of Chagoris to his final years in the Imperium after the Horus Heresy. So, join me in discussing the Kagan and the Primarch that could help tip the balance between traitor and loyalist in the war for Terra. Our tale begins in the Ultima Segmentum on the planet Mundus Planus in the Yasan Sector. Now, we've talked about a lot of different planets and their connection to their former presence in the Terran Empire of the Dark Age of Technology, prior to the Age of Strife. Each planet emerged from that cosmic apocalypse in a slew of different ways, some reverting all the way back to worlds similar to the varying ages of antiquity that match our own history, uh, feudal worlds as they're called. Mundus Planus, the high gothic name for Jagoris, was able to advance their technology to a later medieval time, something more akin to the beloved pike and shot, with heavy plate armor and plenty of black powder to go around. Interestingly enough, the planet's name translates to flat planet, as it is dominated by a single supercontinent that spans a huge amount of the globe. Upon this world, the Khan was teleported by the ruinous powers into a distant portion of it, known as the Empty Quarter. You see, the majority of Chagoris was controlled by a single empire, run by an individual with the title Palatine. This word has its roots in Roman antiquity, for an individual that belonged to the imperial court. It was then used multiple times across the medieval periods to signify various heads of state in varying degrees. The Palatine's empire drums up a semblance to a later Eastern Roman, or really any of the more established empires of the era, Persian, Chinese, what have you. But if the Palatine's empire has that parallel, then the empty quarter has an all too familiar background as well. The smooth grasslands and rolling hills of the quarter were home to nomadic tribes of horsemen, similar to the Turkic or Hunnic histories of Attila, and namely, Genghis Khan, who Jagtai Khan bears a lot of similarities with. More on that later. The small boy was raised by Ong Khan, the leader of a rather small and obscure tribe called the Talaskars. Jagtai was seen as this omen of sorts from the gods. A young boy with fire in his eyes, a clear sign of a great leader of the tribes. Now, we don't really know a ton about this or his time as a child, but it's safe to assume that the natural lifestyle of the nomads lent to many of the teachings and traditions that Chagatai instills in his legion during his time as Primarch. The boy was renowned, though, for his ability to quote-unquote see the bigger picture, as it were, and look beyond the squabbling of inner clan issues to a larger, more unified problem in the Palatine. Even at this young age, the boy was by and large the greatest warrior of the Talaskars. Between his ambition and his skill, Chagatai had earned an air of apprehensive respect from the other tribes that both feared and admired his ability. This would act, of course, as a foreshadow to the days to come. All this withstanding, though, 
The pivotal moment that propelled boy to man was the slaying of Ung Khan by the Kuryed tribe, enraging Chagtai as he gathered the Talaskars to avenge his father's murderers. In a single night, the Talaskars fell upon the Kuryed and destroyed them, burning their yurts to the ground, killing every single man of the tribe in an insane frenzy and enslaving the women and children. The next morning, the dawn broke on a tribe that had been eradicated, and the birth of a resolute man in its wake. Chagatai resolved to end the infighting between all the tribes, to unite them under one banner. The Palatine wasn't necessarily an issue at this point. The, the empty quarter was seen as too vast and open to bother conquering, so it was only occasionally patrolled into by the Empire to hunt the nomads or other game in the area. Chagatai's main concern was the unification of the tribes. Through that, he was both swift and fair, but also merciless if he had to be. This created a fierce loyalty to the new Khan as the Talaskars conquered more and more tribes, absorbing them into a confederacy of tribes. An interesting parallel we get to Genghis or Genghis Khan is Chagatai's practice of conquering a tribe. Once taken over, he would displace a huge portion of the population and migrate other tribes into the land. This would break any cohesion or long-standing blood feuds from the previous tribe. It worked to great effect as the warriors that spawned from this were all faithful to not just the Khan, but his ideal of a unified Chagoris. Through ten long years, Chagatai fought his way across the empty quarter, creating a vast nomadic empire unlike any the world had seen before. And this would all change as the snow began to fall on the tenth year. The Khan and his tribe, moving to their winter settlements to wait out the snowfall, suddenly a huge avalanche cut off the Khan from the rest of his tribe, killing everyone that was swept up in the snowy wave save for Chagatai. As he scaled the mountain back up to the original path that they had taken, the tribe that remained had moved on. It was also just in time to get caught by a marauding patrol of the Palatine's men, no doubt celebrating rush week and smashing empties on their head while hollering about fresh pow. <laughs> this group was led by their heir and son of the Palatine. But Chagatai did not remain in captivity long as he slew the entire patrol save for one man. This lone rider delivered a threat to the Palatine, telling the ruler that the steps was no longer his playground. And as he also handed over the severed head of the Palatine, the war for Chagoris had begun. The Empire sent a vast army of heavy infantry soldiers west, bent on taking revenge for the Palatine's lost son and stained honor. The army was filled with heavy plate armor and various black powder armaments to wipe the Khan's army from the empty quarter. But Chagatai met them on the battlefield on the less. The speed and ferocity of the horsemen made it impossible for the Empire's soldiers to pin down, their lightly armor allowing them to nimbly navigate with their horse archers as volley after volley of arrows filled the dense rank of the Palatine soldiers. For hours, the battle raged on as the numerically and technologically superior Empire army was destroyed nearly to a man. The resulting victory was the final unification point for the steppe tribes who then named Chagatai their Khagan, or Khan of Khans, a title he would carry for centuries. After the battle, the Khagan moved to subjugate the rest of the planet under his rule. With each of the cities he besieged, he presented them with two options, surrender or be slaughtered. Most capitulated as the fear and reputation of Chagatai had preceded him through every city he visited, another of Genghis's shared traits. Eventually, this brought him to the very gates of the Palace of the Palatine. He charged the citizens with delivering the Palatine's head on a spike or be destroyed. The citizens gladly obliged, who had presented their new ruler with the head of the previous one. And in 20 short years, Chagatai had united all of Chagoris under one banner, retiring to the empty quarter to rule from the steppe lands he longed for, out of the crowded hustle of city life, but his reign would only last for six months before the emperor arrived at the tail end of the 31st millennium. Now, most of the stories of the Primarchs tell of the meeting between father and son having some boisterous tale attached to it. When we look at Lehman Russ, we hear about the drinking competitions, or at Vulcan and the many trials it out before the two, you know, usually just some sort of test. Then when we look at Sanguinius or Reboot, we see a more immediate recognition. 
For the Khan, the ever pragmatic individual, he saw the offer of fealty for what it was, as it was the same he had done all over Chagoris. Join or be swept aside. This isn't to say that Chagatai felt threatened by the Emperor, nay. In fact, he, he saw a lot of value in the Imperial truth, and the unity the Imperium proposed, as it was the same pursuit he sought for Chagoris. The Emperor and Horus even remarked that the Great Khan had earned his place in the Imperium, having already brought a world into compliance on his own. Bowing before the Emperor of Mankind, Chagatai followed suit of his 14 brothers before him, but this was a unique time to be brought back into the fold. In our videos on Magnus or Vulcan, it was discussed how much they learned in direct service of the Emperor, fighting alongside their gene sire, learning from his ever-expansive knowledge. The same is true of Dorne and Rus, but this was a different time, and the Imperium had begun to expand wildly out from Terra. The far frontiers of the growing empire needed the Primarchs to further the Great Crusade as conflict opened up on more and more fronts. Because of this, Chagatai spent very little time with his father. In fact, the Primarch series book about Chagatai spends the first initial chapters going over the Khan's conversations with the Emperor and how he needs to be kind of brought up to speed faster. The book then goes into Khan's specific need to change how the ships of his legion operated, going for much faster operating vessels than those of his brother, I'm sorry, brothers, as the legion tactics would be based around speed and lightning quick strikes. This further change to the legion would span to its troops as well. The Star Hunters, prior to Chagatai's discovery, was the original name of the 5th Legion, and their role in the Great Crusade was very different from a lot of the other legions prior to being reunited with their Primarch. It's true that most legions did have specialties pre-Primarch, but they were typically commanded by another Primarch or even the Emperor when it came to bringing more planets into the fold of the nascent Imperium. The Star Hunters, on the other hand, ranged far and wide as pioneer companies. This wasn't a single cohesive unit that operated in a handful of engagements. Instead, the Legion was split into 500 to 3,000 Legionnaire large companies. The pioneer companies would then act as forward scouts and outriders for other legions across the galaxy. The 5th Legion's lack of unity meant that they would develop their own traditions and rituals far from each other with varying heraldry and color schemes. Since they fought alongside their cousin legions, they were able to adopt and absorb some of the customs of those legions as well. This all made for a very kind of ramshackle and distance forced that was only loosely gathered under a single moniker of Star Hunters. This would of course change with Chagatai's great call out to the isolated 5th Legionnaires across the ever-expanding frontier. And what I think is particularly interesting about this is that there's even a measure of, well, mystery before we even get to the White Scars proper. It's assumed the 5th Legion numbered in excess of 80,000 soldiers, but again, scattered to the wind and disjointed. The unifying call of the Khan summons them all back to Jagoris over the course of a handful of years, but only the upper echelons of the Legion know the whereabouts of the 5th after that point. This creates that unpredictable nature and sort of mystique that follows the White Scars deep into the Horus Heresy. But all that aside, the call of the Khan out to the Legion was not unlike Chagtai's genesis as a warlord of Chagoris. Uniting a smattering of insular distant tribes was being recreated only this time with genetically modified super soldiers accompanied by plenty of forearm grasping and shouting of battle brother. In the span of a decade, the Star Hunters finally united on the fields of the Empty Quarter, mismatched heraldry with legionnaires from all different planets. Here, the Coggan broke the name of the Star Hunters upon the plains of the Quarter and reforged the Fifth Legion into the White Scars. Adopting the traditions of Chagoris, the Legionnaires underwent the Blooding, or what is also known as the Ascension. This ritual is divided into two very important steps. The first step is getting a job at Hot Topic, listening to Pierce the Veil, and cutting yourself. Okay, well not really, just the last part. The White Scars are named thusly because of the ritual scars that are self-inflicted upon Ascension. Each of these scars vary in size, shape, and placement. It's supposed to be a test of your own metal. The deeper, more jagged and brutal the scar, the seemingly deeper devotion to the Legion. Now, in these initial moments, this was a 
a very personal approach, but as the 5th Legion expanded, these scars would soon become uniform to the individual brotherhoods, the white scars named for companies, as a form of heraldry and identification. The second ritual is called the naming. In this act, as the blood from their scar dries, each legionnaire must pick a new name for themselves, born again in the rituals of Chagoris and leaving their old lives behind. Again, these first sets of names were personal, typically chosen based off of past deeds in the Imperium's name, but future white scars would choose naming conventions that pay homage to Chagoris, the Kagan, or even both. After the blooding was over, Chagatai had instilled a strong sense of purpose in the Legionnaires, encouraging the study and perfection of the noble pursuits, which is essentially uh, calligraphy, hunting, retelling of ancient tales, a lot of more monastic traits. But what you'll find interesting about the White Scars is that they reflect a lot of different aspects of various Asian cultures. Japanese Shinto in how the Legion's librarians approach spirituality the concepts of yin and yang and their martial arts training, as well as Muay Thai approach to unarmed combat itself. Even the way the Khan fights, as seen in some of the more recent Horus Heresy novels, is more in line with Japanese Bushido. It also goes without saying that the obvious parallels to Mongolians across the entire aesthetic and naming conventions of the Legion. In the beginning of the Primarch book for Chagatai Khan, you are witness to some of the training exercises aimed at bringing the former Star Hunters in line with the White Scar's new approach to warfare, speed. It's an interesting introspective look that we get where the old Legion is reforged in the new by adopting the ways of the Primarch's home world. Uh, typically, this part is always just kind of glossed over in the lore, or it's just kind of, oh, th this happened, and then they're all fine now. So it's fun to see how the Legionnaires can't match the expectations of the clansmen that ascended to Space Marines when the Khan was rediscovered, despite talking to individuals who had been Space Marines for considerably longer time. Through the many trials and tribulations of the Khan, the Star Hunters became the White Scars and were ready to expand the frontier of the Great Crusade. Deliberately choosing the furthest regions, Chagatai scattered his newly reunited legion to the stars, ensuring they could operate with little interference as the Khan was still not fully sold on the concept of the Imperium. He truly only found kinship in his brothers among Horus or Sanguinius. I mean, go figure, everyone always loves those too. But through all of these oaths and new traditions, the legion had still yet to be tested in full. The Khagan had set his sights on a series of planets in what was called the Kolarn Circle. This was a pocket empire from the fall of the Golden Age, where rogue planets of humans, Xenos, and orcs inhabited various worlds within the circle. The Star Hunters had previously scattered out this region of space, so there was a plenty of intelligence to work off of. And it was here that the White Scars would be tested. Deployed throughout the Legion was the Khan's Keshig, the soldiers he had risen from the ranks of his own tribesmen on Chagoris with the arrival of the Emperor, and Mir's Genghis Khan's own personal bodyguard called the Keshig in our own history. These names would echo throughout the history of the White Scars, Targataya Sugi, Hasik Noyon Khan, and Chin Jha, along with other names that serve as a guiding force to the newly reforged Legion. 80,000 legionnaires entered the Kolarn Circle with the intention of testing their oaths and bringing compliance to the lawless belt of planets. The Khan took a number of brotherhoods and spearheaded for the deepest systems within the Circle, fighting a grueling war of attrition on multiple fronts, while the remainder of the 5th Legion cleansed the Outer Rim, working simultaneously from the outside in and inside out. This two-pronged attack married the traditions of both Star Hunter and Chagorian tribe warfare. The scavenging and survival tactics of the pioneer companies aided in the prolonged three-year-long campaign in the inner systems, completely cut off from aid and reinforcement. The hit-and-run and, and ferocious lightning attacks of the Chagoris bled their way into the White Scar's battle strategy, utilizing scimitar-patterned jet bikes to overwhelm the foe from angles before retreating and attacking from an entirely different angle overloading every front. Through all of this, Chagatai Khan wildly fought in the thickest of the conflicts, galvanizing and raising his legionnaires to new bonds of brotherhood and ferocity. He acted as a singular beacon of encouragement. Each time he appeared on the front, the White Scars would outdo one another to earn the right to fight by his side. 
What had initially been a following of the Primarch's lead blossomed into a fierce war of pride as each legionnaire fought harder in their gene sire's presence. In this baptism of fire, the legion's blood was spilled and intermingled. Tregorian, Terran, any of the distant wayward planets that the Star Hunters had hailed from, all of them were reborn in the Kolarn Circle. Their new names and fresh scars as a testament to the fighting and oaths of the Brotherhood sworn to one another in the Kagan. This wasn't an ephemeral ideal, a singular planet, or a scouting mission. This was a combined effort by the entire Legion for the first time in the Fifth Legion's history. Over the course of the five-year conflict, a fifth of the Legion perished. 80,000 Legionnaires from different heritages and planets entered Kolarn Circle, and some 64,000 white scars left. What was once a legion relegated to the fringes and backwater of the Great Crusade had burst onto the scene with a massive tally of worlds in compliance after the full subjugation. In addition, the Kolarn Circle would act as another means of recruitment for the White Scars outside of Tregoris and Terra itself. With the completion of the Kolarn Campaign, the White Scars joined a number of other expeditions with their cousin legions across the galaxy, bringing more and more worlds into the light of the Imperium. But, the White Scars were not welcomed alongside most of the other legions. The somewhat insular nature of the 5th Legion and wild tactics that far departed from the means of warfare of their cousins often left them ostracized by their peers. In addition, the traditions and customs of Chagoras had started to pin them as savages, more akin to the tribes of Fenris than noble members of the Legionis Astartes. This was repeated all the way up the chain to the Primarch, as Chagatai found little common ground with his brothers. Horus and Sanguinius, we discussed, were two individuals that could connect with the Khan, but there was one other, Magnus the Red. Both of them had legions that eschewed the normal way of their brothers when it came to not just warfare, but traditions and value systems. The noble pursuits that the White Scars, well, pursued, was often laughed at by the other legions. What, much in the same way that the pursuit of knowledge that the Thousand Suns sought after was seen as out of place for a warrior of the Legionis, a better left to, you know, remembrancers and other human elements of the Crusade. Outside of Magnus, Horus's similar mind for warfare to the Khans created a bond between the two, as Horus made the Khan feel welcomed even when their other brothers did not. The Luna Wolves and the White Scars fought in multiple campaigns across the galaxy, the rapid assault of the Luna Wolves meshing well with the lightning strike mechanized ferocity of the White Scars. Through these bonds of brotherhood, there were rivalries that formed among the brothers as well, particularly with Martarian and his Death Guard. The two legions were antithesis of one another, and there was barely a contained loathing whenever the two were in proximity, which was not often. Even Lehman Russ, a Primarch that you would think would have a natural kinship with Jagtai, was at ends with the Great Khan. Despite all these complications, the White Scars were successful in forging the frontier of the Crusade, pushing the boundaries ever onward. There is a solidarity to the White Scars that I, that I think I never really enjoyed until I got into the Horus Heresy. Uh, they may not be the lauded titles of the other legions, but they are simply who they are and they want for nothing else other than their own approval. There's a real simplicity to that, that I think sort of puts them above even the Ultramarines and as far as being an ideal legion. Throughout the latter years of the Crusade though, the White Scars were present during the monumental Ulanor Crusade. The massive orc empire of overlord Urlok Uruk was brought down by the combined might of multiple legions, including the White Scars, Ultramarines, Luna Wolves, and even the Emperor himself. The cataclysmic end and fall of Ulanor led to another equally monumentous event, Oris's promotion to Warmaster and the Emperor retiring back to Terra. Now say what you want about how this was received from a lot of different Primarchs, but Chagtai Khan was proud to see one of his closest brothers elevated to this new office. The majority of the Primarchs were present for this occasion, and a number of choice exchanges occur between Sanguinius, Horus, and Chagtai. Whenever Chagtai is the focus of one of the books, he definitely has a voice, and you, you get to peer into his internal dialogue. But in the instances where it's from Horus or Sanguinius' point of view, Chagtai is always seen as a quiet, calculating individual. His words, when he does speak, carry a lot of gravitas. There's just a very keen observance from the Great Khan that you don't get from almost any other Primarch. 
There isn't a braggadocious attitude, or an over-the-top dramatic personality, a resolved grim outlook, or a lot of flourish and fanfare to the Kagan, and I admire that. A lot is said with very little, making his personality really stand out among the other Primarchs as you read through the Horus Heresy novels. But getting back on track, before a lot of the major events would unfold after Ulanor, the Grand Council of Nikea was called by the Emperor upon the world of Nikea. Here, the fate of the librarians of the Legionis would be decided. Up to this point, the librarians were a sanctioned and welcome addition to the legions. Well, most of them. Some were always seen as outsiders, like in the case of the World Eaters. You know, sort of like that guy that comes over to your house and won't stop vaping and saying, It's cool, it's cool. But, but, as the crusade grows ever outward, we start to see a lot of things peering through the material realm. There are instances where people encounter neverborns, or what are called demons. Psychic backlash, other instances that lead some to believe that the psychers in their midst are actually a turbulent danger to the growing Imperium and humanity as a whole. On one side of the council stood Magnus, Sanguinius, and Jagtai. Granted, Jagtai was not present at the events of the Council of Nikea, and Magnus acted as the main defendant, or defendant I guess is, as it were, kind of a loose term there, each one playing a different role in the creation and sanctification of the Librarius, Magnus acting as the main figurehead and spokesperson, Jagatai creating and formalizing the structure and rule set of the Librarius, and Sanguinius acting as a kind of a subtle politician, lending his support and swaying others to their cause if possible. Jagtai's role, though, was kept somewhat hidden. You see, in a galaxy where humanity had embraced the secular truth, there was no belief in divinity, gods, religion, anything of the sort. But the Chagorian Stormseers, or Zadian Arga, were essentially the shamanistic practitioners prior to the Librarius, and had always been able to tap into the wild elemental powers of the warp, fully aware of the warp entities that lie within the maelstrom just beyond the veil. This was called Walking the Path of Heaven. And I'd say that this is probably one of the most understated and also newly founded facts about the White Scars. They are an extremely potent force when it comes to Psykers. This is a status previously reserved for the Thousand Sons, chiefly, with the Blood Angels right behind them. What's been even more interesting is how this new development in the lore has also led to the creation of a whole psychic discipline called Storm Speaking in the 8th edition Space Marines Codex and now in 9th edition. Either way, either way, the council was split, the three brothers advocating for keeping the librarius in place. Magnus went so far as to say that all humans should be trained in understanding the warp, even delving so far as to show off some of his psychic sorcery that he had mastered as he expanded his mind through the ever-changing currents of the Maelstrom. This, of course, horrified the more Puritan elements of the Council. Lehman Russ and Mortarian were chief among the ranks that would cast all psychers on a pyre, proclaiming them witches. Even Primarchs such as Corvus Corax or Rogel Dorn had refused to allow their legions to fight alongside other librarians from other legions. Takatai Yasugi had offered a third alternative. Rather than banishing or reinforcing the librarians, issue further sanctions and limitations on their power, heavily monitoring, but also always watchful, of the ever-present danger and allure of the warp. This harkened back to the original hesitation that the Great Khan had had with joining the Imperium and accepting the secular truth. It was the backbone of belief for humanity, but was all built upon a lie, as the rest of the legions grew to understand and identify that they were in that there were indeed entities within the warp, and that psychers were very much a thing. We are privy to this in the Jagtai Khan Primark book as the uh, as the Great Khan meets with the Emperor multiple times over the matter. Ultimately, the Emperor passes the Edicts of Nikea, ending the librarious departments of all legions, forcing them to be reinducted back into the rank and file of the rest of the Legionis. This also led to the rise of the Chaplain, created to maintain the tenets of the Imperial Truth, as well as ensure the Edicts were enforced throughout the Legionis Astartus. And as the events of the Council of Nikea came to pass, the Horus Heresy had begun across the Imperium. In the initial movements of the Rebellion, there was a great deal of confusion, which was Horus' plan. The White Scars were cut off in the Chondak system, fighting a particularly brutal conflict against the remainder of the Greenskins from the Ulanor Empire. The Ruin Storm, unleashed by the Word Bearers, had severed communication and travel across huge swaths of the Imperium. 
but it was here that the White Scars would gather, the Khan set on discovering the truth of the matter. Reports had come in of the Space Wolves having gone rogue, killing the entire Thousand Suns Legion, Magnus alongside them at the burning of Prospero. There was also contradictory reports coming in from Rogel Dorn, asking the White Scars to return to Terra to help defend the Cradle of Humanity alongside himself and Levin Russ. It didn't end there. Further astropathic messages came in with varying timestamps of as far as a month ago or as little as hours ago. Ferris Manus killed the Fulgrim. Mars was in revolt against the Emperor. The White Scars were to aid the Alpha Legion against Lehman Russ. There was a buy two for four dollars on Bang Energy drinks at a local 7-Eleven. Just a lot of generally confusing correspondence which locked the White Scars in the Chondak system, waiting for the Great Khan to make this his decision. Waiting the word from their Primarch, the entire Ordu of Chugtai received message after message, each one conflicting the last. But the Khagan would not make his move against any target unless he was entirely sure it was the right one. Finally, Chugtai was contacted by Lehman Russ, asked seeking aid as his force had been ambushed by the Alpha Legion after the burning of Prospero, hoping to capitalize on the weakened Space Wolves. The Khan sympathized, but expressed that he could not assist the Space Wolves as he was unsure of whose allegiance Lehman Russ was a part of. This communication led to another correspondence from Terra by Rogel Dorn, demanding the White Scars aid in the defense of the Throne World. In that same instant, a large Alpha Legion flotilla emerged from the warp, mirroring every move of the White Scar's fleet. Neither fleet engaged the other, but a standoff emerged, with the Alpha Legion maintaining radio silence, further confusing the matter. This is when it dawned on the Coggin that this was a diversionary tactic aimed at keeping the White Scars in the Chondak system for as long as possible. But the Khan would not be corralled like cattle, nor would they be contained by the snakes of the 20th Legion. The benefit of fighting on the periphery of the Imperium meant that very few other Legions had experienced any of the White Scar's ships and the unique modifications imbued upon them in the shipyards of Terra and Mars. Most of all Legion's ships had some form of you know, unique twist that fit their Primarch's preferred methodology of war. And as we all know, the White Scars favored speed, far above any other ship in the Legionis. Chagtai had his Legion perform a Zhao, or Chisel, maneuver to attempt to break the blockade that the Alpha Legion had enacted across the Manderville jump points in the system. The White Scar vessels had probed the cordon, seeking a way to break through. Returning Laz fire from the Alpha Legion had pushed back elements of the Vanguard as the entire 5th Legion fleet drifted away from the jump points and towards the gravity well of the Chondak system itself. This brought the Alpha Legion ships in closer, keeping a tight noose around the scattering elements of the White Scars. A discordant heap of vessels split across the stars, their white hulls illuminated by the grazing blasts of Laz fire from the Alpha Legion ships, pockets of the 20th Legion ships corralling more and more of the 5th into this mess of a formation. Then, all at once, every White Scar ship fired their engines and formed an immediate spearhead. Unbeknownst to the Alpha Legion, what was seen as a disheveled, drifting, and frantic retreat was a measured move into a javelin point that thrust deep into the heart of the cordon. Combined plasma and missile strikes blew the front row of Alpha Legion destroyers apart in seconds, the screaming thrusters of the White Scars slamming the entire fleet through the second defensive line as the Khan's expert display of shipsmanship was on display for the Alpha Legion to see. The blockade was broken, and the White Scars were able to depart from the Chondak system relatively unharmed as they made their way through the warp, seeking answers in one place that the Khan knew he would get them. Prospero. So at this point, I'm going to speed things up a bit. N not to spare a ton of detail, but because what happens in this portion is actually a lot of fluff and not really entirely consequential to the overall storyline of the Khan. And also, it won't be a total spoiler for anyone looking to read or currently reading the book Scars. So this kind of preserves some of that fun. But after arriving in system, Chagatai's flagship, the Swordstorm, approached the husk of the former world of sorcerers. Prospero was a dark bulb in a field of stars where it was once a thriving world of roiling white and purple hues. A star system that used to be crowded with comings and goings of various ships was quiet and dead. The juxtaposition immediately set the Khan on guard. As the sword storm grew closer to the planet, a massive etheric field prevented any drop pods or Thunderhawk landing craft from breaching the atmosphere. 
But this would not slow the Kagan in his pursuit of answers. Taking his 12 Keshik bodyguard, he teleported down to the surface of Prospero. The planet that they appeared on did not match the one of the Khan's memories. Gone were the sprawling libraries, tall citadels, and gravity-defying constructs of the Thousand Suns. What remained was a charnel ruin of weeping metal and burned-out craters. The devastation wrought by the Space Wolves was immense, the orbital bombardments leaving nothing but ruin where once repositories of volumes upon volumes of knowledge had resided. While this was going on, another grave situation was beginning to unravel within the fleet and the system around Prospero. Now, with each Primarch, we, we've loosely talked about the Warrior Lodges. And these lodges existed in almost every legion in varying forms and prominence, but the lodges were created by Erebus of the Ward Bearers, aimed at destabilizing or at least creating an allegiance to Horus from within every legion prior to the heresy kicking off. The Warrior Lodges were meant to dissolve the hierarchical command structure and allow all the legionnaires to address each other on common ground. This was no different in the White Scars, and the Warrior Lodges of the 5th Legion had sworn their allegiance to Horus through their leader, Hasek Noyan Khan, one of the Kagan's most trusted captains as well as acting leader of the fleet in Chagatai's absence. Hasek had used this opportunity to execute a grand coup d'etat, taking over control of the Legion to then deliver the Khan to Horus so that the War Master might show him the error of the Emperor's ways. This action spread throughout the fleet as personnel were dispersed from Horus loyal elements of the fleet to the others, positioning themselves to take over in one fell swoop. With Hasek in total control, there was very little questioning to his actions for the exception of Shibhan Khan who had seen through the ruse. Taking his brotherhood, they prepared themselves to resist the coup that was in the works. Now again, back on Prospero, the Khan finally made his way through an ornate tunnel system, having cut off from his Keshig in an ambush by enslavers. Almost all of those Keshig had perished for the exception of a handful and Chinja all of which were attempting to find their wayward Primarch with the aid of a lone Thousand Sun Sergeant, Revuel Arvida, a character who would go on to become the first Supreme Commander of the Grey Knights. We'll get back to that. The Khan makes his way into a large auditorium, revealing that truly all of Prospero was in ruins. But in this auditorium, he discovers a familiar presence, if it could even be called that. The ethereal form of Magnus the Red appears before the Warhawk of Dragoris. The Wraith had explained to Jagtai that he was not truly Magnus, but a psychic remnant, one of the many fragments of Magnus that would go on to play a huge part of the Crimson King's lore, especially in the latter days of the 41st millennium. This is where we get a particularly poignant conversation between the Khan and Magnus about the nature of chaos, humanity, and the actions that have transpired up to this point. The Spectre shares that the Space Wolves were sent to make Magnus answer for his transgressions of breaking not only the Edict of Nikea, but also shattering the psychic wards around the Webway and Golden Throne that protected the Throne World from demonic incursions, all of this to warn the Emperor of Horus's heresy. Even further, Magnus reveals that Chaos is not the ally that Erebus or the Word Bearers think it is, but merely that we, loyalist and traitor alike, are all tools in the grand game against the Emperor, tools meant to destroy the Emperor and restore the ruinous powers. Now, if I'm allowed a, a little bit of personal interjection here, I think that the Horus Heresy is made that much stronger by the existence of all of the lore that takes place in the 41st millennium. Because when you read this revelation by Magnus, he's sitting there talking about how he knows what is coming. And there is definitely a forlorn but resigned attitude to the Crimson King. And this is made stronger because you, the reader, know exactly what he's talking about. You know, the creation of the Imperial Creed, the existence of the Emperor as a divine figure, the Black Crusades of Abaddon, the Cisatrix Maledictum, all of the events of the current age of the Imperium, and how Magnus is talking about piercing the veil and seeing that nothing in the warp was ever benign, and it was all aimed at tricking us. How every Primarch, in one way or another, is paying for their hubris. This is all laid out before Chagtai, before, essentially, he rails against it, saying he will never let it pass. But the very nature of the Great Khan is that he is unpredictable. And through that, through his emperor-given gift in a lot of ways, he is the wild card of the heresy. Not even the Chaos Gods know which way the Khan will swing. 
And that's what Magnus tells him, and that he has two choices. He can join the defense of Terra and try to prevent Horus from beating the Emperor, or ally with the only brother who he saw eye to eye with to create the Imperium Horus has envisioned. Both routes had their benefits, and it was up to, Con up to the Khan to decide. Create the dream he shared with the Emperor of a unified humanity, or join Horus. Chagtai probed Magnus, trying to see where his allegiance lie, but again, Magnus talks about how he knows all too well what's on, the side, on this side of reality, and that the Emperor will never forgive him, so his fate has really just been sealed. After a further conversation on the Council of Nikea and Chagtai's regret that he, is not, that he was not there or present during the, the Council, Khan makes his decision. Swinging his blade outright, he shattered the warp ghost that was Magnus, splintering it like a broken window pane. Chagtai Khan, Warhawk of Dragori's Khan of Khans, had the answers and truth he sought. Now he could finally set his sights of war and decisive action. The confusion and indecisiveness that had roiled him since Chandax had faded, and purity of purpose set in. In orbit, the coup d'etat had fully escalated. Hasek had requested aid from Horus, who responded by sending the Death Guard and Mortarian. Shiban Khan had breached the sword storm, looking to supplant Hasek, while also being reinforced by Jemalun Noyan Khan in a last-minute bridge teleportation. The Legion was set to tear itself apart. It needed their Kagan, who was now facing a new challenge. On Prospero, the Khan had reunited with his Keshig, and the Death Shroud Terminators, accompanied by their Primarch Mortarian, were set to square off. The two Primarchs, having been at odds with one another for a long time, it all boiled down to this moment. There's typically you know, one Primarch that is the direct antithesis of another, either through doctrine, personality, or what have you. Uh, Angren and Rus, Dorn and Perturabo, Kurz and Korax, or Sanguinius. But for the Khan, it was Mortarian. Extreme speed and fast attack actions of the White Scars against the implacable and immovable grinding force of attrition that is the Death Guard. In their exchange, the Khan argues with Martarian, telling him that the two of them were both outcasts. But the Martarian railed against that position while the Khan embraced it. We, we see this happening so many times in these types of conversations, like when Sanguinius tells Conrad Kurz that both could see their end, but Sanguinius had accepted it as his role while Conrad raged against it, deeming it unfair. Now, at this moment in not just the book, but the entire Horse Heresy series, you've only heard about the Khan fighting. You haven't read or witnessed it through any other narrator's eyes, and it was probably one of my favorite moments in any of the 40K Black Library books. It's the grueling duel between Martarian and Chagtai Khan. The swift and precise blows of the Khan's Dao smashing into Mortarian scythe silence as he weathering, weathered the lightning assault of the White Scar, returning in kind with devastating swings of his gigantic scythe. Both Primarchs tore armor and flesh from one another, deep gouges and crimson painting their grimaces as the duel was mirrored in their bodyguards around them, each one fighting a bitter duel for their lives. As the duel neared its conclusion, Mortarian received word of the void battle beginning in orbit and teleported off of Prospero, robbing the Khan of his kill and enraging Chagtai further, but the Warhawk had issues of his own to deal with. Mortarian had told him that half of the 5th Legion had already sworn to Horus, but when Chagtai teleported back to the Swordstorm, he had interrupted the bridge battle that was set to determine the fate of the coup d'etat. Ending the coup and routing the Death Guard fleet, the White Scars Legion was saved from the brink of collapse. Hasek and his conspirators thrown into the holding cells, and the Khan had restored order, delivering purpose to his legion and siding with the Emperor. After the events of Prospero, though, there's a whole other book, Path of Heaven, where the Khan runs a four-year-long campaign of hit-and-run attacks against the traitor legions, attacking their isolated pockets and supply routes, as it were. In this book, we get the discovery of a device called the Dark Glass, which is sort of like a kind of like a proto-golden throne. It laid the groundwork for the technology that was used to then create the Emperor's future living tomb. The Khan also loses his best friend. Stormseer Yasugi sacrifices himself to open a warp gate through the technology of the Dark Glass, enabling the Khan to arrive in the Soul System in time for the siege. Now I'm glossing over a lot of that because it's not hugely important to the plot of the Khan here, but it does lead to the creation of Janus, or Janus, as basically the synthesis of Arvida that we talked about before, his essence after he had succumbed to the Thousand Suns' dreaded flesh change and Magnus's psychic remnants. 
Janus would go on to become the Grey Knight's first supreme commander, like I was saying earlier. And as for the Siege of Terra itself, we know that the White Scars were present, but the Siege of Terra books have been taking a long time to really roll out in their entirety. So I've decided to do, what I've decided to do is kind of cover them in their own video, summarizing what happens throughout the entire course of the events of the Siege as a whole. Since it's such a wide spanning battle that starts in the distant reaches of the soul system before eventually crawling to the gates of the Emperor's palace on Terra. But until we get full details of the Khan's contribution to Terra, we do know of one specific instance of the Khan leading a daring counterattack against the Lion's Gate spaceport, attacking at dawn and overwhelming the garrison station to hold it as the forces of chaos siege the planet. The spaceport was overwhelmed in the course of a handful of hours. The defenders killed and the defense batteries brought back online, firing into the drop pods and landing crafts of Horus's army, immediately shattering supply lines and reinforcements down to the surface. This counterattack galvanized the defenders of Terra, who attempted to then retake the Eternity Wall spaceport, but were pushed back by the forces of chaos. Regardless, the remainder of the siege, the White Scars orchestrated hit-and-run tactics throughout the thoroughfares and trenches of Terra, destroying hard targets to cripple the advance of Horus' army in critical locations across the walls of the Emperor's palace. In the years after the Horus Heresy, during the Reformation, the Codex Astartes was extended out to the many legions of the Imperium by Robu Gilliman, aiming to dissolve the legions and splinter them into multiple chapters. Never again would one man be able to wield the might of so many marines under one banner. Except for Rogel Dorn's Last Wall Protocol, but don't tell Bobby G about that. The Khan, like many of his brothers, begrudgingly accepted the tenets of the Codex Astartes to prevent another civil war, leading the White Scars as the primogenitor of the many successor chapters created off of the Khan's gene seed. In the second founding, the Destroyers, the Marauders, the Rampagers, and the Storm Lords chapters all can call Jagtai Khan their gene sire. For 70 years, the Warhawk led the White Scars, defending the Yasan sector and fighting primarily against the Drukhari that had raided Chagoros in his absence. Chagtai had sworn an oath of vengeance against the Dark Eldar and was hellbent on bringing their end. In 084 M31, the Great Khan disappeared into the webway, pursuing a cabal archon of the Drukhari, never to be seen or heard from again. Of course, the adage remains that he'll return at a time of great need, just like Corvus Corax or Lehman Russ. And since then, there have been little teasers here and there. You know, some say he is imprisoned in the Drukhari's home city-state of Kamaral, uh, Dark City. Others say he is locked in stasis within Trazen's The Infin Infinite's Grand Collection. Only time will tell what happens to the Warhawk, but I imagine we will see his return before long in the 9th or 10th editions of Warhammer 40,000. With three other Primarchs on the board for the Traitor and Loyalists, it's high time another is due. But Chagtai stands as one of the most enigmatic Primarchs of the 20 created by the Emperor. So wild and untamed that not even the Chaos Gods can weave their intricate plots around his decisions. The White Scars are one of the more minor legions when it comes to the older lore for the Horus Heresy. So in the last five or ten or so years, as the Horus Heresy has fleshed out more of the history of these seemingly minor legions, we've gotten a whole breadth of knowledge and to dive into. It's fun because there isn't a huge amount of pre-existing ideas for how the White Scars dealt with the Horus Heresy, so writers like Chris Wright have been able to craft a really amazing narrative for how they intersect into the grand plot of the era. Whether on the frontier of the Imperium defending Greenskins or other Xenos threats, or riding wildly into combat at the forefront of a cordon of jet bikes, Jagtai Khan's lightning strikes echo throughout the millennia as the White Scars tell the stories of the warlord of the plains that became the master of the stars, uniting a planet and attempting to unite the galaxy in his father's image. Although the history books on him are slim, each page is dripping with epic exploits of Chagtai Khan, the Warhawk of Chagoris and Khan of Khans. I want to thank you so much for watching here today. I know this has been a long time coming, and I promise I'll try to get these out on a regular timeline once more. I'm not so sure who the next Primark will be. Uh, Alpharius seems to be hotly requested, but I'm waiting to see what the next Primark book is to come out. I really want it to be Sanguinius because I want that like limited edition Sanguinius book, but hopefully, hopefully... We'll get a conclusion to the Siege of Terra novels as well so that we can dive into that portion of their lore in the next Primarch series, whatever one that is. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Don't forget to like, comment, all that fun action. 
but have a good one and take care.